Hi, welcome back to our show. We thank you so much for always watching, because as you know, we like to dive in deeply into real estate, bring you insights from industry's finest leaders. And today I'm so thrilled to have one of my wonderful special friends who's been on the show before, who I truly admire and is one of the beacons uh, of real estate information in the United States, um, Steve Harney, the founder of Keeping Current Matters. And for those of you that don't know Keeping Current Matters, if you're a real estate agent, you better know, it's an amazing platform that really has helped us agents to demystify the marketplace, really see trends and strategies for our career, for our buyers, for our sellers, to help empower us, to help empower our clients and guide them through the tumultuous nature of the real estate industry. So I'm just thrilled to have our esteemed guests back again with us today, uh, the wonderful Steve Harney, who will share his insights and his unparalleled views about the real estate market moving forward in 2024. So, Steve, I'm so happy to have you back. I haven't seen you it's since. It's an honor, Christoph. It's an honor to have to be, you know, asked to come back on something on your show because you know what I think of you. You know what the industry thinks of you. You know what, you know, was that, you know, somebody said to me, because they were all excited that I was talking to you today, another luxury agent. And they said, do you realize, Christoph, is not like one of the greatest luxury agents in Los Angeles or California or the United States. He's a premier luxury agent across the world. Well, thank and you. This agent was like so excited. I felt like I was all, all going to be going to call with Taylor Swift or something because they're like so <laughs> jumping up and down. Well, I'm not quite like Taylor Swift, but anyway, it's a nice compliment. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I mean, being in Beverly Hills, for those of you that don't know, I'm, I sell real estate in Beverly Hills, kind of the greater LA area. Uh, I do tend to work more in the luxury space. However, we sell everything. We sold a property for 800000 last year. We're listing one for a million two this, this month. So we kind of cover everything. But when you talked about international, being that I'm half French, half Korean, and I've traveled the world rather extensively since I was young, and I love the luxury market, and this was an interesting survey, 40% of our luxury clients were surveyed by our company. And, I mean, all of them were surveyed, but 40% uh, of them plan to buy an, a property outside the U.S. in the next couple of years. So I thought that was really fascinating. Um, as part of my day-to-day -day business this summer, I went to Europe, and specifically, I went to preview properties for two clients in the south of France and Italy. They're American clients that I've known for a long time, and they trust my expertise, and I speak the languages, and I know the people there. So I was able to go and preview and tour properties for them to help advise them as to you know what they should do, where they should buy, the kind of property, that kind of thing. So yeah, your 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 customer service, even if just in that, like you would just say, oh, and then I went there to preview properties for them because I know how to speak the language. Your customer service is like unbelievable. It's it's you know you're you're the poster child for how to do everything right as a real estate professional. Well, I truly appreciate that coming from you. But today it's about you. I want to hear your expertise, and you've been. Yeah. I know you own real estate companies and thousands thousands of agents, if I remember correctly, and. Uh, but you, you, when did you found KCM, by the way? How many years ago has it been now? Uh, back in 2007, through the mess of uh, the great financial crisis, right. a lot of realtors needed help. So I started going out and trying to give them a better understanding of what was taking place and how the economy was impacting everything that was taking place in the real estate market. And I got myself a little niche there. So then we, um, we've brought it from 2007 we're now 55 employees over 28,000 square feet in one wow. of the premium office buildings in Richmond, Virginia. So uh, it's turned into something much bigger than I originally anticipated it being. Yeah, and I'll tell you, I mean, as, a, as an agent, having even though I've done this for 33 years, uh, first thing every morning, I get two or three emails from your company with <laughs> articles and things to post and graphics and details. And now you have your local market insights, which is also very valuable. But as an agent, it's so be beneficial to me and my clients. And you provide a great service to the agents. And I believe that the more you give out to others, the more it comes back to you. So you've been offering us a great service uh, and giving us a lot of information because the more we know, the easier and better we can help our buyers and sellers to make the right decision. And uh, just like going to a doctor or to a lawyer, uh, right. people really want our expertise and advice. And especially nowadays that the brokerage communities come under fire with all of these you know, lawsuits that have been going on, more and more we have to provide our clients more of those services. Um, and it's so funny, the last several clients I'm working with, past clients and some new, I shouldn't say past, they're all clients. Even though they're in the past, they're always current clients. Right. It's mm -hmm. interesting, they, they see a property, they want to know about it, they want the comps. But then it's always, what do you think? What's your opinion? How would you advise me? 
And that's just like when you go to a doctor, they tell you all this mumbo jumbo about all the medical conditions. And then you're like, well, what doctor, what should I do? What do you advise? So right. I appreciate what you've done to help advise us as agents to be able to educate uh, the people around us and educate ourselves so we can have effective communication with our clients and give them the right information. So yeah, being that's the goal. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we've had a couple of crazy years from the beginning of COVID, ups and downs and interest rates skyrocketing and lowering. And so so give me a little synopsis, in your opinion, of of where you think the market is headed overall in terms of, first of all, pricing. Like, where do you see pricing headed for 2024? Well, what might have taken place? Let's just go back one year. Of course, that's where the craziness happened. You know, we had... uh, 2021 at KCM, we call it the unicorn years. They were years we've never seen before and we will never see again in regard to you know home appreciation. Of course, we had multiple double digit appreciation years for one yes. right behind the other. Yes. And going into 2022, it looked like at least through the first quarter of that year, we were going to have three years in a row. And then very obviously, um, the Fed decided they wanted to get inflation under control, uh, mortgage rates. And the things that help mortgage rates increase that is what they increased. The mortgage rates shot up very dramatically, very quickly. Um, and everyone, almost everyone anticipated that, that what it was going to do was create a panic in the housing market that would force people to put their houses on the market. Mm. And it was going to be this super flood of inventory. And that over flood of inventory was going to bring us back to a 2008 situation with prices dropping, people getting into the negative equity. And what they forgot to realize is when they raised the rate to, um, you know, it actually got to 8% at one point, The as the rates went up, um, first of all, 30.7% of the country doesn't even have a mortgage on their house. Yeah. All right. And then the one that, and the rest of them, they, they had mortgages like two and a half, three, four percent it's 70.7% of mortgages today have less than a 5% interest rate. 70%, wow. That's 78.7 or and see the 70.7 or 78.7. I'll get you that number. Wow. But, so it's over 70% have that. So what they didn't take into consideration is all those homeowners said, why? Well, I'm not selling my house. Yep. I'm sitting on a deal of a lifetime. Why would I sell my house right now? So they were projecting going into 20, 2023 that we were going to be losing some said five, 10, or some said 20, 25 percent of the housing value. We're coming out of this year with the when we had a little bit of a challenge at the beginning of 2023. Mm-hmm. We're coming out of this year. We're going to, as a nation, wind up just be between five and six percent. Uh the five December appreciation for the year. Yeah, so that's full appreciation. Now, just historically, if we look at the national numbers, uh if we look over the last 40 years, it's 4.92%. That's so historical, 4.9, okay. Yeah, 4.92 is the historical. And you know, soon I'll be able to give you the California numbers. And you know, I might even be able to give you the LA Metro numbers. The um, uh, I don't have them available yet because we're working on that new technology right now. At <laughs> of course. <laughs> that's, where, that's where we're going with it. The um, But as a nation, that's where we are. So really what's happening to the market, it's returning to normal. Right. So what we're projecting in 2023, and the you know, different people are projecting any numbers from 1% to as high as 7%, we think it's going to come in pretty much right at normal again, right around 5%. Yeah. What does that mean? It means that if you're going to buy a house, if you're going to sell a house, don't worry about pricing. It's not going to crash, and it's not going to go up 20% either. Yes. It's going to be a normal <laughs> situation. So. You should be making your decisions not just from the financial aspect. You should never make your decisions just from the financial aspect. But over the last couple of years, the financial aspect really weighed heavily on any decision. Home yes. Was, yes. Or potential homeowner was thinking about. It. Don't worry about that anymore. That's that's done. It's interesting to I me about the interest rate situation. How much that affected our market. And as you know, when the I was one of the lucky ones that refinanced. December, just before the rates started going up in the spring a year or so ago, right? And I'm I'm under 2.75% fixed for a jumbo loan. Well, uh, just so you know, just by you saying that, you have a bunch of people hate you. But go ahead, keep on going. I, you know, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny thing is when I started real estate in 1989, I was 18 years old, rates were 16 to 18%. 
and 18 years old. I didn't know any different. I just thought, oh, that's the interest rate. I sold a lot of houses. People bought, and I don't recall anyone at that time being, oh my God, these rates are so great. People bought, and I don't recall any clients really, and there were a lot of first time buyers complaining. So, but, but, you know, rates went basically from under three to in the sevens and eights within a 12 month period of time, which right. I think gave a lot of people sticker shock. Yeah. Now, now uh, the rates have come down again. I'm surprised that not as many buyers have jumped on the bandwagon, but I'm sure they will. And when they will, when they do actually, uh, I think we're going to see with our lack of inventory, see a big surge in sales and which will increase the prices. I, and I think what I think is taking place, I think we're already, first of all, for this year, uh, we're projecting a, a major jump up in, in transactions, the number of houses sold. Okay. We're not talking about a little, you know, we're talking about a pretty major. Last year in total between existing home sales and new home sales, uh, as a nation, we sold about 4.7 million. We think we're going to do a little less than a million over that. Really? So we're looking at, yeah. So we're looking at, you know, pretty much a 20% increase in transactions. And uh, I'm, you know, you know, some people are saying, "Well, Steve, you're being very aggressive," and I just keep on saying, "Well, look back to what I predicted last year. Look back <laughs> to what I predicted the year before that." All right. So I remember I was at the Tom Ferry event, and mortgage rates were rising in August, and I said, "I think by the end of the year we're going to be in the sixes. Yep, you did. People thought that. I was crazy. Yeah, they just said, "Like you're nuts. Like that. That can't happen." And right after that, they went to eight, and everybody was, you know. <laughs> texting me so yeah i told you it's going to be 10 it's not going to be six so i didn't text them all back when it hit six percent uh uh but it was uh gratifying to know that you know I, I made another call that a lot of people disagreed with that wound up to be true now on that point of the mortgage i still think we have room to fall so i think that uh pretty i said very aggressively in fact i said at that last august that by the middle of this year, that I thought we'd be in the fives. Like the first number would be five, even with 5.99. Yep. And I think that's a psychological kick to a yep. lot of people also yep. sellers and buyers. Yeah. Right. Um, and I still feel that. Now, the interesting thing is just recently, you know, first American said, yeah, that might happen. Dean Baker said he thinks it's probably going to happen. And Fannie Mae has projected yep. that by the middle of this year, interest rates are going to be under six percent. Yeah. All right. So the craziness that I said is now looks like it's going to come true again. Uh, and I'm not trying to brag about that, but that's what I'm saying. Now, I will tell you this, that I think that the sellers, part of the reason we had small, uh, small transactions was definitely rates. So I'm not arguing that, but it also was a lack of inventory. Yeah. So I think that if a sell, I, I really do think this is prime opportunity right this second I think the buyers have already coming off the fence, but the sellers haven't brought their inventory to market yet. Right. As quickly as right. So any seller who beats the so-called spring market yep. is putting themselves in the best of positions because they have a buyer that's ready, willing, and able to buy yep. with a lot less competition. I will so see that my clients- sellers on the phone, potential sellers on this call, I should say, do yourself a favor. Talk to Christoph today. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny because sometimes sellers don't want to list in the month of December. I always recommend listing in December because, yes, maybe the number of sales overall go down 10 or 15% because of the holidays, but the real buyers are out there. Right. And so if they don't, then I say, well, come on June 15th, June 20th, I mean, January 15th, January 20th, because, yeah, as you well know, I mean, when California and LA is not really as cyclical as other parts of the country where there's right. snow and cold weather. So, but we do start seeing an increase of inventory starting mid January up through probably June, July. And then it kind of tapers off a little bit during the right. summertime. So, I always say if you're one out of five, it's a lot better than one out of 15 in four months yep. with the competition. So, uh, and so with people with rates, how do you advise them? Because, uh, you know, a lot of, and by the way, I always call you the guru because your predictions are right. Most people get it wrong. But I remember in, when we did an interview and during COVID, when COVID was first starting and uh, there were every headline was, we're going to have a huge wave of foreclosures, huge amount of foreclosures. And you kept saying, no, no, no. You had the data to support it. And I was honestly a little bit skeptical. I said, oh, geez, people are going to lose their jobs. But you were so right on spot. It never happened. Right. The, it, it, the big call from the outsiders were prices were going to fall 10% and transactions were going to fall 20%. 
And it went the opposite. In, yeah, in early March of that year, I said, I think prices are going to go up 5%. And I said, I think prices are going to go up. And I think we're going to sell more houses than we did last yeah. year. And yeah. I got ridiculed like I couldn't believe. People were like, why do you, why do you mind? You're crazy. You lost your mind. You're too old. Get out of this business. And it wound up that we finished that year, prices a little over 5% in that, that first year. Uh, and we sold more houses than we did the year before. Yeah. So again, you know, he, here's the tricky thing about residential real estate. If you're looking at commercial real estate, that's all numbers. If Absolutely. you're looking at the stock market, it's all numbers. There's no there's emotion in there. Metric, no. a lot of, right. If you, there's one metric in the residential real estate business that a lot of forecasters, forecast models don't put put into consideration what's that and that's human behavior yeah people are people you know it's not the numbers people are people yeah. and where everyone was saying well everyone is going to lose their job and i'm going to say well unemployment spike let's take a look at who lost their job yeah and, and when they went up to 14 percent, a lot a tremendously large portion of that was yeah. restaurant and hospitality now it's horrible that those people lost their jobs yeah but a lot of those people were 16 year old kids working at McDonald's. <laughs> That's right. They, they weren't going to buy a house anyway. So as we broke it down from income, the people who are losing their jobs, and this is a horrible thing. They lost their job. I'm not trying to brush away. They lost their job. Yeah. But the people who are losing their job weren't the people that were going to buy a house anyway. And the people that could afford to buy a house, what did they want to do? Now they had a kid living with four other adults yeah. in this little bedroom apartment, you know, four bedroom apartment over the pizzeria. Yeah, and the parents are saying, "Get out of there, get into a house." You know, just that you have to get get yourself separate. Yeah, a lot of the secondary market, like the vacation homes, that we pulled a lot of that forward because people said, "Let me get a place where my whole family can go to and we can be safe." Yeah, but exactly. we figured out the human piece of that. Yeah, well, what are people thinking? Forget about what the numbers are saying. Only yeah. what are people thinking? And we always include that in our forecasts. Clients always say to me, should I buy a house now? Should I wait? I always believe if it's right for you and your and this is the residential market, right for you and your family at that time, then you buy. It doesn't really matter what else is going on. I remember when we bought our last house, uh, the rates, I think, were around 8% uh, for the mortgage. And we were looking at a certain price range, and we just couldn't find what we wanted after looking for quite a long time. And we, by mistake, found a house that was 20% over our budget. Uh, but I, we looked at it and we immediately said, this is the right house. Plus it needed a lot of work. It needed like 20% of the cost of the house to remodel it. But I said to my wife, I said, you know what, you know, even, even though I felt we were at the top of the market at that time, I said, it doesn't matter. We can afford the mortgage. Could we'll go to a couple less dinners or charity events, but we can buy the house. We can afford it. It's not going to change our lifestyle. So let's do it. And we did. And now we're like, we're six times more than what we paid for it at the time. And I remember when I bought it, I called two of my friends in the office that were experts in the neighborhood said, I wanted to pay a certain price. The seller wanted a higher price, of course. Uh, I talked to my two friends. We all came up with the same exact number of what it was worth. But I paid 10% uh, more than what I thought it was worth in the experts. And I'm glad I did. Because today, it'd be very difficult to buy that house in the neighborhood with the prices the way they are. Right. Well, I'll give you a similar story so that the people that are listening hear it also. Um, when I decided to buy a place close to my son down in Virginia, I decided to go to North Carolina right on the border. Is that, that the lake house you bought for the family, that one? Yeah, the one I bought for the family, like a family retreat. Yes. And I gave them a, I gave them a budget of $600,000. Okay. You find one for sale. Of course, they didn't do that. They found one for a million dollars. <laughs> Oh, uh, so I went down there and I did exactly what you did. Can we do this? Can we afford it? Can we put it? Let's put the dollars together and we could afford it. All right. So as long as we could afford it, I said, let's go for it. Exactly. Let's see what that, let's go for it. That house tomorrow, I could sell for over $3 million. And that was five years. Yeah. All right. So, you know, people always say to me, and, and we have graphs showing this, well, home values go up and down. Prices go, well, no, they don't. If you look at the last 42 years, there was four years during the great financial crisis, they went down. Yep. The other 38 years, they went up. Yeah. So the prices don't go up and down. That, that's not what happens. <laughs> they might, during a year, could you know, do a little floating, but at the end of the year, what's your appreciation? Yes. And really, the value of the house you purchased, the value of the lake house I purchased, both of those values weren't in the numbers. It was it's in the experience. Family relationships and what it creates for you guys, right? 
like we've had family come over. We, we have 30 people come and stay for 10 days. Yeah. Now, at the end of the 10 days, I'm going to kill a couple of them, but you know, like it's, <laughs> it's probably pulling my hair out. I get but it. It's a great experience. Yeah. It, it, it's, and, and, you know, sometimes we've taken so much about the numbers over the last couple of years that we forget that you're buying a house because you want to change your lifestyle. Exactly. You want to be, you upgrade your lifestyle or you want to downsize so you don't have so many things to worry about, depending yeah. on where, where you are in your life. Yeah. And the, uh, that's the real value of the house. I agree. Like, Right now, we're in a situation where you can get both. With rates coming down, prices moderating, wages going up. Now, you, I think this is prime time. Yeah, like I'm telling people, hey, you miss two and a half percent interest rates, mortgage rates. That but would probably got to wait for them to come back. You got to wait for your great, 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 great grandchildren, maybe. <laughs> All right. So this is this is in prime time. If we get these rates in the mid sixes, we hit five, definitely. Well, I think. Every heck is going to break out if we if we hit five, yeah. even if it's five point nine nine. Yeah, because again, there's the psychological thing that all right, we're, we're getting a good rate. And I tell my clients, I said, look, I mean, look, before I got the two point seven five or under two point seven five percent rate, I think we refinanced twice before that over a four year period. We went down to the sixes, then down to the mid fives, and all of a sudden, we had this opportunity in, in that range. Oh, actually, we refinanced at three something, and then came down to so. I know it costs a little bit of money to refinance, but I, I do the numbers. I'm like, okay, it's going to cost me X amount of dollars to refinance with the points and the fees. But if I save X amount per month, I recuperate that in eight or nine months. So right. I'm going to stay there. You have no reason to, to not do that. And, and that's what I try to explain to people. When they you know, say, well, what, if rates are going down, should I wait? I say, well, prices are going up, but I don't see any, you know, there are individual markets. A lot of, and I don't mean to make fun of either one of these markets because they're going through some difficult times. California is the, the, the most beautiful state in the continental United States. I agree. I would say it's the most beautiful state in the 50 states, but I don't want my friends in Hawaii having an argument with me. Hawaii's so pretty darn nice. Decent arguments. Yeah. I'm not saying they would win the argument, but it would be an argument. The, <laughs> other, the, other, 49, the other 47 states don't have any argument. But what happened was, for a lot of different reasons, people left California. It was that mass exodus, and then you know, and a lot of them wind up in, in in Boise, and a lot of them wind up in Austin for the tax purposes. And those cities now, you know, I'm not sure everyone that landed there staying there. <laughs> All right, so it, it, it's like it, people left California to, to to get to Boise because the prices were cheap, and you know, it was a little bit more area for them, and. You know, um, what was the name of uh, the show? Yellowstone was on. Well, I could buy like a small ranch. And, and then when the snow came, they're saying, where's the sun? Where are the beaches? Where's the closest beach? So I, I think that there is, and again, I'm not trying to beat on Boise or uh, uh, Austin. They had tremendous years of appreciation. And they're coming down a little bit off those years of appreciation. They still did very, very, very well. Um, but, you know, California is still California. Yeah. All right. So it, it, we just have to realize that. And I think that that will moderate to some degree. Now, so if prices are still strong there, you go back to the interest rate question. And if prices are going to increase there, which they are, they're going to increase in California and increasing in San Francisco, Los Angeles, San, oh, San Diego. San Diego is jumping up a lot. So if they're going to increase, you you should buy now. Like if you find a house that you can afford, buy it now. We'll okay. see. What about if rates go down? The thing with mortgage rates, only three things can happen. Either they can remain the same, no loss, no foul, yep. no blood, no foul, or they could go up. Well, thank God you bought now. You didn't have to have a higher rate. Uh, and if they go down, you refinance. That's exactly Don't let the rate get in your way. Yeah. Yeah. People get caught up in a psychological turmoil that, oh, the rates are this, like, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. It's, I don't quite, that doesn't seem logical to me. Right. Well, it, it's tough when your brother-in-law, when you go to Thanksgiving dinner, keeps on bringing up that he got a 3% rate and you have to take one at 5.5%. Yeah, I'm not going to say that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out <upset. laughs> Not a good thing, right? <laughs> so um, basically there's three points. I want to talk about uh, your advice for sellers, your advice for buyers, and your advice for agents moving forward for 2024. So for a seller that says, okay, you know, I'm at in the sixes or in the sevens, or actually maybe, uh, no, I'm sorry, they have a lower rate. 
but they want a bigger house. They want to change a neighborhood. And, and often in the in the luxury world that I live in, these people can afford to buy whatever. They, and they do pay cash often, but sometimes they refinance. But there's a psychological factor. But people buy a house because often in our marketplace because they want to show people they've arrived. Right. Maybe their business was doing X five, five, 10 years ago, and now they're doing 10 times more business. So they want to say, hey, look at me, I'm successful. So what would you suggest to a seller that's thinking about selling, but they're concerned about, oh, my rate is low, but I got to do a higher rate, but they want to change their lifestyle. So how would you advise them on that? Well, if they're going to make it a financial decision, which is really what you're saying, right. you know, I'm going to have to go up to a higher rate, then the only thing I would ask them is to take the total financial situation into consideration. So what do I mean by that? Your clients are in a very special situation. Because you've already brought up the fact that their lifestyle, where they live, how they entertain, um, you know, that type of situation impacts their business. Yes. So if they're moving from one lifestyle to an upgrade lifestyle, what they're they're living the real life that people with no money try to live by taking pictures outside of somebody else's Ferrari down in Miami. <laughs> All right. The, the, the Instagram people, True. they're living the real life that I've I've accomplished something. Yes. And continue to accomplish something. What is the value of that ability to entertain? What is the value of you establishing that you have arrived? Yes. What's the value of you establishing not only have arrived, you know, I'm at the pinnacle of, of what I'm doing. What is the value to your business? Yes. So let's take that financial gain into consideration. Then I always say, if you have a house worth $100 and it goes up 50% in the next 10 years, you made fifty thousand dollars. If you have a house two hundred thousand dollars and it goes up fifty percent, you made a hundred thousand dollars. Yes, you doubled your money. Yes, and if we're going to look at rate now, well, let's look at appreciation going down the road. If you're going to be locked into a less expensive house and be afraid to buy a more expensive house because you're the rate, well, let's put all of the financial pieces together, not just your emotional consideration of one right. aspect of the financial equation. Right. And that equity piece is, is the piece that everyone misses. Kids, you know, by kids, I mean young adults. Young adults miss that. They're saying, well, you know, I, if I rent, I'm going to pay less a month for my monthly housing expense than if I buy. Right. But if I'm not taking into consideration, that rent payment is only going to be there, be lower than the, the mortgage payment because the mortgage payment stays relatively flat in your right. Your state is almost definitely flat. The insurance is going up. I get that. But your tax situation isn't as bad. So now they have a situation where they're renting five, six, seven years from now. That's yeah. going to switch. Yeah. And at the end of 30 years, the person who bought the house doesn't have a payment. And to my knowledge, and I'm not sure about this, but to my knowledge, I've never seen a renter stay in a rental for 30 years and <laughs> the landlord give them the money when they sold the house. That doesn't matter. Right. That's right. right. So it, the same thing at your level. Now, you're, we don't mind that we talk about renting versus buying, but at your level, the same thing. Let's take the whole picture into consideration. Yes. And equity is a major piece of that equation. Yes. And I think about it now, I, I, we do own a number of investment properties and rents for the first time uh, as of this year, we were able to raise rents in Los Angeles, which is, it's been like three years, right? So we were able to raise it 4%. They allow us 4%, which is great. And I tell my clients, I'm like, well, you know, with, as a renter, first of all, we can be raised anytime they allow it, number one. Number two, uh, they can kick you out in 30 days at the end of your lease, right? You've got all of a sudden, you got notice, you got to move. So, so there's a lot of challenges with that. And people don't realize, but uh, I, I truly believe that, you know, ownership of properties, whether it's a duplex or a single family home, start where you can. My wealthiest clients were school teachers years ago, 40 years ago. They bought their first property, their second one, their third one, their fourth one. And now they have a $100 million portfolio. I wish I would have done more of that. Buying and buying. And buying. <laughs> Me too. Me too. <laughs> they, and, and, and here's the funny thing about that. You know, I always tell people like, and say, well, the prices and who knows. And I said, this is what I guarantee you. 20 years from now, your child, like I'm assuming I'm talking to like a 40-year-old, when your child turns 25 and you're sitting at the restaurant having dinner, this is what your child's going to say. When you bought the house back 25 years ago, why didn't you buy 10? We'd be rich. Our family would be rich. 
And the reason I know that's going to happen in 20 years from now is because that's what I said to my parents. That's what my parents said to their parents. That's what my grandparents said to my great grandparents. Yeah. Like over time, not, not the next two years, next 17 seconds. Yeah. We have to look at longer time horizons on the, it. It's almost like more like a 401k <laughs> than it is, you know, like, like a, a, a quick, your know, six month CD. Yeah. Do you don't look at it like a six month CD. You look at it like it's a 401k. You're putting money away for the future. Yeah. And if you do that, that, that money will build. So the rent versus buy comparison, there's a no brainer. You know, I can obliterate that instantaneously <laughs> just with the equation. It's true. And when you think about it, it's just, you know, real estate is always the best investment. And, you know, stocks, if you're really smart and savvy, even if you're smart and savvy, you may not always make money. But, you know, stocks can be worth $100 a share today, and then something happens that share is worth two bucks tomorrow, right? right. Real estate, when there are declining markets, it goes down in increments slowly. It doesn't just all of a sudden you lose your entire value in one day. It just never it never happens. I mean, the crash of the mid-90s, the crash of the, the 2007, 2008. Uh, so it just, it, it's a, it just, it's a, it's a, it's hedging, in my opinion, hedging against all the bets of life. It, real estate, the reason I own several properties, the reason that my children own several properties is the fact that I believe in it. Yeah. All right. It, it wouldn't, my family wouldn't be doing it if I didn't believe in it. And, you know, I, I, there are people that are on the other side of it for whatever reason, you know, and, and you know, they're saying, oh, no, you should rent it. And some of those people have their own agendas for that. All I know is, you know, where you're going to be in 30 years in both yeah. situations. And I love when people say to me, well, you know, insurance is going up, the HOA fee, if you're an HOA, is going up. And and I said, well, who do you think is paying the increase? Yeah. You think the landlord's paying that out of his pocket? He's putting that back into the rent. Well, they might not be able to raise the rent that high. Well, the landlord's going to keep the property if he's not making a profit. Yeah. So either he's going to raise the rent or he's going to sell the house. Yeah. So like you said before, either you're going to get a rent increase or you're going to get an eviction notice. What are those two <laughs> things you're going to get so I'll give you a funny short story. About 22 years ago, I had this eight-unit apartment building in an area called Silver Lake in Los Angeles. Uh, it was for sale for $349,000. Oh. Uh, a judge was the owner. He was my client. I had the listing. Uh, it was on the market. We had offer after offer, but it was like 330, 330, eight-unit building, 330, 335. He wanted 345. I mean, for 8,000, he wouldn't sell it. So finally, I got to a point, I'm like, well, wait a minute. I said, the building wasn't really cash flowing. If you put 35, you had to put 35% down in those days for an investment property. Rates were at like six and a half, seven percent, I think, at the time. So I thought, well, I could buy I could buy this building. Um, it's not going to cash flow. It's going to have a little bit of a negative right now, but I could use a tax deduction, right? Who can't use a tax right. deduction? And I just I, I felt it was a great upcoming neighborhood. So we bought the building. Now, 22 years later, we paid it off about four years ago. The three hundred and forty-five thousand dollar investment is now worth three point five million dollars over a twenty-one year span. We own it free and clear, and uh, we get one hundred ninety thousand dollars a year income from the building. Of course, yes. Our this this morning, my earthquake insurance went up from nine thousand to fourteen thousand. Our property insurance went up from eight thousand to twelve thousand. So yes, insurance is a big, big challenge in California. And I thought Florida about, too, Florida too. Yeah, Florida and other parts. I mean, all around the country. Right. So I thought, okay, we're we're now paying twenty nine thousand a year in insurance, which is a huge amount of money. But uh, luckily, we did our four percent increase uh, February first, as of February first. So, but I'm so glad. I, and I think back of over the years, there were listings I didn't sell. Had I just bought the listings, I couldn't sell. I wouldn't have to work. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth. I would, and, and I agree with you wholeheartedly, but Christoph, I've known you long enough that I think that if you, if you hit the lottery and had hundreds of millions of dollars, you love helping people. As I would I work. Ask, yeah, I, 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 I want to ask you a question because yeah. everyone's asking me. You like, like this superstar. Like when I said that I was going to be talking to you, everybody I know, oh my God, could they have so, like, I hope your audience realizes who you are, because you the one thing you do a horrible job at is bragging. You are one of the best agents in the world, and I'm not sure everyone understands that on the outside, because you're so humble. You're such a humble guy, you know, and, and 
I hope the audience realizes who, if you're walking into their house to help them, I hope they realize who's walking into the house to help. Well, thank you. That's what they say to that. It's funny. I mean, we're in one of the number one offices in the world for Cobalt Banker. All right. So educational videos. So, I mean, I met you initially through Tom Ferry, right? So uh, I didn't go to college. I was 18 years old, got out of high school, was modeling, went right into real estate. So no college education. I barely got out. I mean, anyways, I won't go through that story. But uh Education is so important. So I don't listen to the news. I don't listen to CNN. I, I watch you because you give me information I need to know for my clients. But to watch CNN or CNBC and hear all the bets, it's just, I don't need that. So when I'm in my car, all I listen to are podcasts. Podcasts from Tom Ferry or Gary Vaynerchuk or or Brian Tracy. or and, and I, I consume information that educates me. And I love to learn. I've always loved to learn. And that will never, ever change in my I grow and I feel better. So that's the most important thing. Am I muted again? All right. No, no, you you went out for a second, but you're, but you're back again. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Yes. Because they're asking me, your customer, your, the trust your customers have in you is exceptional. Like it's, it's beyond, you know, what people can imagine trust to be. Like they just, they're sending you to Europe to make sure they're buying the right house. True. Okay, so there's a trust there that that how do you develop that trust? What why would if you could give three keys to that? And I know you're supposed to be asking me questions, but <laughs> you, you're really the it, it, you have a lot more to say about a luxury market that I could ever have. Uh, number one, and number two is I'm really interested because you've done such an exceptional job of that. It it, it it's confounding. Well, process. thank you. I would say the number one thing is. When I first started in real estate, I was 18 years old. The president of our company, Jack Douglas, who owned John Douglas Company, was one of the leaders in real estate in the country. He had 30 offices in Los Angeles, independently owned. But we were, I think the first year in our awards dinner one night, I said, Mr. Douglas said, what would you advise, advise me? He says, always do the right thing. That was his advice. Always do the right thing. And my mom taught me that way. My dad taught me that way. It's just, you just doesn't matter what I want. And over the years, I've lost a lot of deals because I felt it wasn't right for them. And I advise them as such. And I lose a big commission, but I just didn't feel instinctively. They make the decision. Sometimes I advise them no, and they still do it. That's fine. But always do the right thing. And I always try to put, you know, the old, old expression, put yourself in people's, other people's shoes. So I think about who my buyer is, who my seller is, what are they dealing with personally, emotionally, physically, whatever, and how can I just put myself for a moment? And it's just it's taking time to really reflect on who they are and what they are, and how I can be of service and of kindness and of love and and giving back to them. And it may not come from this deal, but it comes from other deals. Right. So it just if you give that good energy out, I just believe in that it will come yeah. back to you. All right. Listen, could you do me one last favor when we're yes. finished? Could you clip that last three minutes that you were telling what it is and make <laughs> that a training video that every real estate agent in the country is mandated to watch because you hit it right on the head. When, well, when, I, when I first came into the real estate business, I, you know, my mom and dad had different reactions to it because I'm going to full commission sales and I was leaving a pretty decent job that yeah. I was walking away from. And my mother said, you're going to be selling used cars on the corner in six months. All right. And my father turned around. He said, are you going to go into commission business? Let me give you some advice. I said, sure, Dad. He said, always worry more about the person sitting in front of you than you yeah. worry about yourself. Great advice. Said, if you worry about the people, the money will flow. If you yeah. worry about the money, the money won't flow. Yeah. So what you got from your mom and dad, what you got from your original broker, I got from my pop too. If we worry exactly. about the people sitting in front of us, what's the best possible thing we can do for them? then everything else is going to work out. So I'm glad that you said that. But you said it a lot. You articulated it much better than I could. And you were much more eloquent in the way you said it. So please clip that out and send it to me because okay. I'm going to mandate Casey. <laughs> watch that. Steve, you and I are the same way. I speak from the heart always. I may be right or wrong. I just say what I truly, truly feel. And look, I can be honest. I mean, at night I go to bed and sometimes my mind starts spinning and worrying about this and that. That's so unbeneficial. So I immediately go to a meditation. I wake up in the morning at five or five thirty or six, and 
I'd wake up and sometimes I'm excited. Sometimes I'm not like all of a sudden I'm like lay in bed maybe for five minutes and like my brain's like, I bought this deal, that deal. And I start getting worried. Worry is the worst thing ever invented in the planet, right? We got to focus on our qualities, our kindness, our love, our, our value. We, as real estate brokers and, and you, you've added so much value to me in my life, you know, just as a person, and also as it helping educate me and which which is then a chain reaction it's me my buyers my sellers my family my friends everyone so the more we give and and give of our energy and it's 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 all energy and and love then the more we get back i knew it was a reason i loved you so much i knew it. <laughs> uh, I, I knew it was a reason are you going to be in Orlando uh, next month for, for the uh, elite retreat? No, I'm, what I'm trying to do to the best of my ability is retire. All right, I'm going on second. You can't do that, Steve. Yeah, I'm not, I'm no, that's, that's what everyone keeps on telling me. But I have uh, upticked my work in the office and doing the research and, and putting out some of the, the, the new stuff Casey is putting out. But I'm trying to limit the amount of times I'm getting into a plane and tra traveling somewhere. I, I now have two grandchildren, and uh, you know, I purposely bought another home up near where they live, right next to where they live, pretty much. And I spend a lot of time with my grandchildren, and I, and I, I just I don't like giving a lot of that up. So yeah. I try to stay local as much as I possibly can. So I won't be in Orlando, but I understand it's going to be a phenomenal event, and I understand that there are people going to that event simply because you're going to that event. Oh, come on. <laughs> I hope not. Now, it, 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 I know you don't like to do this, but again, your audience has to know who you are. When now, they, I'm not saying you don't do a good job of building your brand and your and promoting and all that kind of, but who's in you, who you are in your heart? You're very, very you're a special person, but just, not just a special agent. Well, that basically made my entire day and week <laughs> <laughs> coming from you. So, I want to thank you so much. The my guru of real estate information is is Steve Harney. Keeping Current Matters. If you're a real estate agent, and you don't subscribe to Keeping Current Matters. Uh, I don't be negative, but there's an opportunity for you using Keeping Current Matters. This is not a sales pitch for them. It's just, I believe in it and I trust it. And I use it every single day, multiple times. It's beneficial to you because the more you know, the more you feel confident, the more you can help your buyers and sellers. And that's what it's all about. And Steve, the fact that you would take time again to meet with me, Let's try to do this every quarter. I appreciate you so sure. much. Sure. This is an honor for me. This is not a, a, a burden. It's a blessing to me. Honor for me. So I want to come visit you. Remind me where you live. Like, where's your main residence? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I live part of the time down in Miami. I have a place on the ocean down in Miami. I live part of the time at my lake house in the summer times. And uh, this time of year, I'm up in Virginia, which is closer to my grandchildren. Okay, so, so uh, what Miami. time of the year you're there, that's when I'll go. So one of okay. these days we're going to get together in Miami. I'd like to meet you in Miami, but I'd really like to come to the lake house. I like to fish. I never get a chance. Oh, it's a I, great thing. They, they do fishing tournaments there, ESPN. It's a really great fishing lake. Oh, so definitely, definitely. We'll work something out this summer coming up that you come out to the lake house, you and your wife. And spends a couple of days there. I would My wife probably to. won't come, but I'll come. <laughs> That's okay. You'll come and we'll spend a couple of days. But when I was All a right? kid, I loved to fish. And I just, it was one of my favorite things. So thank you, my friend. I appreciate you so much. The guru of real estate, my friend, uh, confidant, and I appreciate you. And thank you so much for everything. You're, you're no a problem whatsoever at all. Bye-bye, guys.